Welcome back to JB Squared. I'm JB Hager, joined by Johan Bernil, and we're going to take a look at stage 11 of the 2023 Tour de France, a sprint stage. And I think we're going to dig into some record book type stuff here. You know, when you have a, a sprinter like Jasper Philipson, who's already won their fourth stage and one tour, start talking about records. We'll get to that in just a second. Okay, Johan, I think I'm dying to hear your thoughts on yes, uh, Jasper Philipson because he's so dominant right now. And uh, earlier in this tour, I was like, my gosh, has anybody ever won all the sprints in a Tour de France? <laughs> which, which is a difficult thing to measure that type of record because some stages aren't just flat sprint stage. It's hard to determine. Was yeah. that really considered a sprint stage? So that's a gray area. So let's jump in with your thoughts on... Uh, on Jasper Philipson winning his fourth and just seeming to be the fastest guy in the peloton. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, he's he was the big favorite for today, you know, after his three bunch prints. Um, today was his sixth Tour de France stage win after winning two in last year's Tour de France. Uh, but today, I think, was different. Today was um, different for different reasons. Um, number one, he did not have, um, I don't know the exact reason, but he did not have Mathieu van der Poel as his lead out guy. Um, I don't know if van der Poel was caught in, in uh, anyway, I saw him get in a group behind with three, four kilometers to go. I've read somewhere that Mathieu van der Poel was struggling with a little virus, a little, a little illness, and that he's getting better. Um, but he didn't need him today. You know, he had Søren Krag Andersen doing that last uh, good pull. And then he had Jonas Rickard, like stretching it out, but not doing a lead out. And, and, and today, what was really impressive, seeing Jasper Philipson from the helicopter, was the, his ability to, and, but for, to do what he did, you have to be really in control and you have to be um, at 90% and then have that extra a little bit. He went from one wheel to the other, but he just he didn't just go to any wheel. He picked first. He was on Wald Van Aert's wheel, then Van Aert got boxed in. He went to, I think, Caleb Ewan's wheel. I I think, and then at the end, he went on Dylan Grunewagen's wheel, and and there really what was impressive is that he just waited and waited, and actually let Grunewagen, who was being led out by. I think Lucas Mesketch from his uh, from Jaco was an incredible lead out guy. So Grunewagen went. Normally, when a guy from like Grunewagen goes, he knows. Okay, this is my distance. I know I can make this to the finish. Mm -hmm. Yet Jasper Philipson was still waiting, and he just let him do that that first fifty first fifty meters, and then came around him and and the the, the dominance uh, with which he won was was really was really impressive. Um, it's, you know, the, the first time that he doesn't have Mathieu van der Poel as a lead out guy. And also I think the first, the first sprint he wins in such a dominant way. And that actually there was no controversy around, <laughs> you know, there was no changing of trajectory or no, mm -hmm. nobody getting boxed in. It was just straight to the finish. And, uh, I mean, he's on a roll. He is, he is by far the fastest sprinter right now. I think if everything goes to plan and he doesn't get sick or he has no accident, uh, I don't see who can keep him out of the green jersey in Paris. Uh, and the tour is not over. You know, he's he's going to win another sprint. Oof. So he he, he will he, he will probably win five stages, which, you know, as of today, the, the last rider who won four stages in a sprint, well, it's not so long ago. It's 2021 Mark Cavendish who won four stages when he was on quick step and then won the green Jersey. So that's two years ago only. Have you ever talked to sprinters about what's going through their mind? Because a sprint is chaotic. And just as you described, he's, he's just floating from wheel to wheel. He's just, he knows his, it's instinct. You know, they probably, mm -hmm. it's probably like um, if you've, you know, people who study jujitsu, you know, they, they ju they just do it naturally without even thinking about it, and I also get a sense that sprinters are able to slow things down in their brain a bit compared to the rest of us. Most of us, it would just feel like chaos. If yeah, you were, if for you them, were no, for them, it's it's completely different. It's a different, it's a different profession. You know, it's a different, it's a different bike industry. I would say because 
I'm always, always surprised to see how, you know, a sprinter after the stage, how they break it down or how simple they see these things, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, okay. Yeah. You know, and then this guy came, I went on his wheel, looked around a little bit. Then uh, unfortunately the guy came to the, to the left. I had to give him a little push and just, and then I went for it. It all seems so simple, but <laughs> I it, know. It, well, and it's not enough just to be the fastest. Like we know that Wout van Aert is fast and we saw him get, he's, he's had some challenges on all of his sprints mm -hmm, this tour. Mm -hmm. And then Germay seems to be coming into the picture and he, he just didn't follow the right wheel today. Yeah. I don't know if they're as fast as him, but they're, but my, my point is it's not just about being the fastest. It's those instincts to weave through this mess. Definitely, definitely. But, but to do what Philipson did today, you know, to not having his normal lead out, but yet having this ability to choose his moments, you have to be like with some extra power left. Uh, otherwise, you, I mean, when you're under limit already, you can't make those decisions, you know, and you have just one choice. If you, if you make the right choice, you're fine. If you make one little mistake, there's no way you can correct it. Yeah. Today, in today's sprint, Philipson didn't make any mistakes, but if he would have made a mistake, I think he would have been able to correct it and still win. That's how, in today's sprint at least, that's how dominant he was. It's so, um, I mean, listen, win, win four stages, uh, and this was stage, what? This was stage 11. 11. And he won four already. <laughs> uh, so, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing can go wrong anymore for him and for Alpecin. You know, they, they, this is a dream. This is a dream, dream tour, you know. Um, the best would be if Matthew van der Poel can win a stage, you know, because that would be the, make the picture complete. You know, chances are getting slimmer and slimmer mm -hmm. that van der Poel is going to win a stage. Uh, I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but uh, anyway, independently of that, um, for Alpecin and for Philipson, this is this is incredible. What's it going to be like for Philipson and these other sprinters? Like, there's another chance at stage 18, and then of course in Paris. But well, I mean, the, the, we, today, we we today, looked at the, the next four days. Whew. Today, Philipson said. Today, Philipson said, and I, I would have to look back. He said he still sees three possibilities. So I don't know which other stage he thinks he can win, but he wow. he thinks there's still three <laughs> stages that can finish in the sprint. You know, I, I know we've talked about it in the past, uh, but we have a lot of new audience. Um, uh, so maybe it's worth visiting again is, you know, sprinters get, it's very streaky, right? When they have momentum, they're on fire. It, you have to be incredibly confident to mm -hmm. be a good sprinter. Their confidence is off the charts. Like fighter yeah. pilots are that way. Right. Uh, it, maybe share a little bit with that, how you see sprinters get on a streak for one, one grand tour. And then, you know, it could yeah, be, I mean, it we, could, it could be Grunewagen who's on a streak right now. Yeah. You know? We saw, we saw, we saw that two years ago with Cavendish. Um, last year, Philipson sort of sort of started his streak a little bit. He won the last two bunch prints. So, you know, he had to fight for it. And then finally he got that win. And then he won very dominantly in, uh, in on the Champs-Élysées uh, this year. There's no discussion. Uh, and it also, you know, I mean, if I, I think it has a lot to do also with um, the ability and having the luxury to be relaxed, uh, I mean, between brackets, uh, <laughs> you know, um, Philipson has won four, four sprints already. You know, you, you kind of are in a position that you can allow yourself to look and 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 then you don't make any mistakes. If you're really desperate for that first win, it's almost guaranteed you're going to make a mistake because you're so eager to to get it right. I mean, normally what Philipson did today, he went there, then he went there, and then he went back there. Uh, that's you know it, it it has to go wrong normally, and you get boxed in. So, for example. Uh, Grunewagen today, he, I think he, I mean, he had no other choice, but, and, and the speed, the, the speed was the difference in speed between Grunewagen and, and Philipson was remarkable, but he got finally in that position where he saw this win in front of him, right? He got a free road. He saw the line. 
he went with 200 meters to go, which is a distance that he knows he can, he can maintain. And he just went, you know, he just went a bit too early. Uh, I mean, maybe not too early if you don't have Phillips in there or if you don't, if Phillips is not that, not, not, not that strong. Um, but yeah, I mean, the one who's on a roll definitely is, uh, is, is, is the Oscar Phillips and it's, um, and, and the confidence his, his team must have also, you know, I mean, uh, you know, add to that, for example, that a stage like today and any other stage that will potentially be a bunch print, they can actually sit back and say to the other teams, okay, you know what? There's a break gone. We're not, we're not doing this. We won four stages already. If you want to win that stage, you better start going. And then maybe we'll set one guy with you to help. But on our own, we don't care. We've won four stages. So they're now in this position where these other teams, like Lotto Destiny, like uh, Sudal the Koenig, uh, they can play with that. They, they, they can basically force them to control the stage and then just put one guy there to be nice uh, because they're not desperate for a stage win. Mm. Uh, you know, refresh our memory. I know we've started doing a trades and transfer show uh, as a new thing this past year, but in 2020, Philipson was on UAE and he was there for a couple seasons. What do you recollect went down when he, you know, left that team? Were they just more GC focused? Uh, yeah, well, what I, mean, was I, I know he came from uh, yet another another guy who came from Axel Merckx's development team. Um, what is it called? Axion. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, Axel, Axel. Hagen, Hagen's Berman Axion. Hagen's Berman. Yeah. 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 Who, by the, which by the way, will now co- become the official satellite team for Jayco Alula mm. next year. Um, but he came from there. Um, and I think he was 19 years old. So he went to UAE. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he was there in, uh, in 2019 and 2020. Um, and, and that's also the, the season that, that Tadej Pogacar started with UAE. That's actually why, why they're such close friends. They were two teenagers in, in the big league. So obviously they found each other there and, and that friendship still <clears throat> goes on this, this, uh, at this time. But I personally think that he did win. He did win, uh, some races. I, I remember he won a stage in, the tour down under. Um, I don't know if it was in his first year or his second year, um, but that was a world tour, a world tour race. But I think he left because at that time they had uh, Pascal Ackerman and Fernando Gaviria, who mm. were top sprinters. I think he left to have more opportunities for himself. So he went to uh, he went to Alpecin. There he encountered uh, Tim Merlier. So he had to share with him. Uh, and then I think Alpecin did the, the, the correct decision by letting Merlier go and investing um, and believing in, in Jasper Phillips and who is mm-hmm. definitely, I mean, let's not forget, you know, this guy, okay, he's a sprinter, but he almost won Parido Bay this year. You know, he's a, he's a really, really complete bike rider. He, It'll have to be, it's, it has to be a hard stage before he gets dropped. Um, so I think the reason why he went to Alpecin was because he needed, he wanted to have more opportunities for himself. In Alpecin, they do not have anybody for GC. So obviously whenever he goes to a race, he will have a complete team around him. Whereas if he was on UAE, maybe he would have two guys with him to help him. And then the three other guys would be at the service of, uh, of the, the guy for GC. And he's only 25, by the way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's throw that in there. Uh, you know, not to put you on the spot, Johan, but you are a walking encyclopedia. Since we're talking talking about a guy that got four stage wins, I was, you know, watching the television this morning. I go, what is the most number of stage wins in one tour? Mm-hmm. Well, we, do, we, know, we know, JB, the most stage wins... And all the tours is 34, right? I think we've talked about right. a lot. Eddie Merckx and Mark Cavendish share that. Um, 
But I, I mean, I, I, I did my research. I didn't know this uh, off my heart. But um, <laughs> let's see. So the most stage wins ever in one tour. You should auction eight. off that notebook at the end of the tour, Johan. It's it has a lot of. <laughs> I don't know if people can read it, but as as yeah, here it is. Oh my gosh! Um, I'd love to read that. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. But the most uh, stages in ever in one tour. It's eight, so one rider, one. I mean, riders won eight stages in one single tour. There's more than one third of the stages, uh, and three riders uh, got that. So one, the first one was a rider we already talked about in the past, uh, Henri Pelissier. It's also the guy who won uh, with his brother together with uh, with his with his br- two br- the two French brothers. So in 1930. Henri Pelissier won eight stages. And, and they did have one. Oh, and I wonder how many stages they were doing that year. I, total. Don't, I don't even know it was 21 stages. Right. Probably wow. not. Probably not. That, so, that's an interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll look I'll look that up for the next time. Okay. Um, but um then impressive. That's impressive. You know, this is uh this is uh Eddie Merckx. You know, Eddie Merckx won eight stages. On two occasions in 1970 and 1974, uh, and this is not being a sprinter, which is extremely difficult. Right, right. right. So wow. I mean, if you're a sprinter, you can say, okay, you know, I mean, but if you if you're an overall guy and win eight stages, that's just unbelievable. So on two occasions, and then another Belgian guy who, who I personally know also quite well. He's from my 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 area in. Uh, in Belgium, and he was a guy that was I was idolizing when I started cycling. Is Freddie Martens? Freddie Martens. Mm. He won eight stages in 1976. Um, he was a sprinter who then became a very all-round rider. So uh, I, I'd say those eight stages, most of them would have been in the sprint, um, but probably not all of them because he was also good at time trialing and uh, you know Freddie Martens. Uh, was so strong he was he was named as the next Merckx you know 1976 that's when Eddie Merckx started to basically scale down and um, not win the tour anymore and Freddie Martins went on to win the Tour of Spain as a sprinter and he won 13 stages in that one Tour of Spain (laughs) so that's quite impressive Wow. Is that a guy you're in touch with or no? I actually was, I, t- I visited him uh, two years ago or two, three years ago. He lives nearby uh, where my family lives. And he was, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting story. You know, he was super successful, but he had a short career and he got really taken advantage of by people circling around him. Mm. lost a lot of money and uh and freddie was actually um he had a job in one of the cycling museums uh like the historic cycling museums and um there's two big big museums in belgium one is in audenarde which is the tour of flanders museum and then there's another one in Russelara, which is more overall not so much about the tour of flanders and so freddie wanted to change from Audenarde to Russelare. And um, he asked me if uh, if I knew how uh, how to get uh, a yellow jersey from Lance. And so I still had one jersey left, which was signed by Lance, but not dedicated to anybody. Mm. So I brought that to Freddie yeah. and, uh, and gave it to him. And that's hanging now. I mean, he kind of um, probably got the job with that jersey. <laughs> Uh, and, um, but you know, I mean, I was there and he told me so many stories. I mean, showed me his bicycles and the guy also was twice world champion. Um, and, uh, yeah, incredible, incredible, uh, incredible racer. So he, uh, I, re- I do remember in 1980. So here we're talking about 1976, uh, he faded away then. And then he came back in 1980. Uh, nobody believed in him anymore, but yet he found a team and he got to the tour. He hadn't fi- he hadn't won one single race that year. Uh, he had hardly finished one race that year, but he came 
into shape just before the tour in 1980, and he ended up winning five stages. Oh, wow. The green jersey. The green jersey. When you're completely then, doubted, that makes it even all that much sweeter. And then one or two months later, became for the second time world champion hmm. in Prague, beating Bernard Hinault and Giuseppe Saroni. Wow. So, uh, yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a myth. You know, the guy's a legend. This is a kind of out of left field, but, you know, we saw it a lot in a lot of other sports where 60s, 70s, maybe even the 80s, you, you weren't, they weren't making a ton of money. Of course, they weren't mm. doing it for the money. Yeah. When, when, what was it like for that era, for Freddie financially? Because you think about these guys re retiring, you know, in their mid 30s or something. It, you know, and to support themselves the rest of their life. It's got to yeah. be challenging. But when did that, the big dollars really kick in that you reckon mm -hmm. that, that you could, if you are a star in cycling, you can retire and never have to worry about money. again. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys, definitely not even, even Eddie Merckx. I mean, Eddie, Eddie Merckx earned a lot of money, but still, you know, I know stories from Eddie and from friends of him that, you know, they actually had to go and race the, the, the post Tour de France crits to make extra money mm. to, you know, do the, do some six race, six day races in the winter to again, get some extra money. I know for a fact, and it's well documented that Freddie Martins, when he retired, he had no money. Mm. He had lost everything, you know, and the guy has been working. I mean, I think he's retired now, but, uh, he's been struggling, uh, financially for, for a very long time. Um, I think it changed. I would say in the, in the mid nineties, probably, uh, early nineties, mid nineties, but a very, very few, I mean, a handful mm -hmm. nowadays, there's more, right. There's mm -hmm. more, uh, some of them make good money, but if you look at cycling on a global scale compared to any other sport, it's still, it's still nothing. Oh, I know. You see, the, to, you see these you know, these soccer player salaries, and you just yeah. Go. I mean, like, like right now, for example, the best cyclist in the world. I don't know ex the exact numbers, but I it's it's around it's five to six million euros per year, right? And that's one or two. Yeah. And then you have yeah. a few a few there, and then and then you know under one million, there's there's the vast majority. And then under under two hundred thousand per year, it, it's massive. The amount of riders who make less than than two hundred thousand. There's riders who make fifty thousand. Yeah, right. So and and, and often yeah. often have two residents to to, yeah. to take care of as well, right? So let's not forget. You know, this is something you can you can you can make money during ten years, right? Yeah. So. Um, no, it's 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 not in comparison to any other big sport. And if you think, I mean, I saw, I mean, I don't know if that stat was right or not, but I saw, uh, I mean, the Tour de France is the first or the second most viewed sporting event per ye every year. Um, you know, if you can, I mean, you could say the Olympics or the world the World Cup. Uh, football, soccer, as you guys call it, but that's mm -hmm. only every four years. Right. Um, the Tour de France, the, I mean, the, 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 the amount of interest and, and viewers and audiences is, is crazy. Yeah. So obviously, yeah. you know, the people who make the big bucks is the Tour de France here. And uh, the riders who are the main actors in that show that is the Tour de France, they, uh, they don't make that much money if you look at it. If you would look at it average, the, what what the, the the average is on the whole Tour de France? It's it's not it's not spectacular. You know, it, it, I'm getting way off topic here now, but it's it's intriguing to me. Has there ever been conversation about a pension for professional cyclists? Now the mm. the top guys that, like you said, that make might make five million a year it doesn't matter. But if you if you're a base salary guy, but you spend 10 plus years in the Peloton, it almost seems like there's, I mean, we saw a big change in American football before they had pensions. You know, these, these guys get banged up for five years 
and can't do anything after that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now they have these pension programs where they're going to be okay. They're not going to be homeless. They're not going to be rich, but they're going to be okay. Like it seems like this would work well for cycling because their careers end so early and the risk of injury is 10 times most sports. I think there is something that I don't know the details about it. There is some kind of pension fund. Um, but I don't know how that's being used or if, I mean, I don't know how much it is. Uh, I really, I really don't know really. Uh, what, what is for sure is nothing like what you just explained me that, that, that doesn't <laughs> exist in cycling. Yeah, I know. It seems like they should be able to make, you know, a hundred grand a year, you know, in retirement or something. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, it's messed up. We talk about that every year. It's very messed up. Today's show is brought to you by Ventum. Uh, you'd be shocked to know that you could pick up an all new GS1 for just under three grand, twenty nine ninety nine with the SRAM Apex AXS. And if you didn't know, the GS1 is the brand new gravel bike. It's incredible. That's the same frame I ride. It doesn't matter if you build your bike out at $3,000 to $15,000. They do one NS1 frame and one GS1 frame that is specced out top of the line. You know, a lot of other brands will sort of downgrade the the carbon build on a frame for a a lower price point on a bike. All Venton bikes are the same frame, same one that Lance and George ride. And, And you'll see when you go on their site how cool it is to spec out your bike, pick what you want, build it out the way you want. They've got a lot of guidelines to help you pick things. And uh, you can pick the, um, the, you know, the handlebars you want, the width of those, the crank length, uh, of course, the components, whatever you want, if it's SRAM or Shimano or different levels, you build it out how you want it, including the wheels too. You can upgrade the wheels from the, or just take the alloy ones that are great that come with it. And there's no upcharge on that. But go in there and play around with it, tinker with it and build it. And you'll see what I'm talking about. It's really great. And I hope you're participating in our uh, Ventum trivia of the day because they are going to give away a brand new NS1 at uh, after stage 21. We'll do that on that last show. So 10% off now when you use the code we do at checkout, W-E-D-U at VentumRacing.com slash the move. Today's show is also brought to you by Ketone IQ by HVMN. Uh, We've been talking about this since they launched it back in 2017, and we've been talking about it ever since. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I did bring a couple here, but this is the uh, little um, portable shot size. I say portable travel size. It's real easy just to to take care of it that way. Or you can buy them in a bottle like this, uh, much bigger. This is actually 10 shots in one bottle. I'm talking to my friend, Stefan Roth. This is 10 shots, not one. He'll get a kick out of that. This is, this is 10 shots, not one. Uh, <laughs> and so anyhow, I've been using it for a few months. I definitely can vouch that it has helped with my mental clarity. Could be coincidence, but I doubt it. Uh, from the moment I started taking these, I just have felt on, the, on an upswing with mental clarity, energy, focus, all those kinds of things. So... Uh, over 60% of the Peloton is using this, um, and, you know, for, for performance and for mental clarity. And it's also available at any Sprouts in the U.S. now. So you can save 30% off of a subscription order of Ketone IQ at HVMN.com slash The Move. Uh, I know another thing you want to talk about before we look at tomorrow and maybe you want to look at the next four stages as a whole i'm not sure but let's i know you wanted to talk about uh tom dumoulin was doing an interview and of course he was just yeah. he's he's fresh out of the peloton what did you pick up from that yeah well two things uh he was on he was on vive le velo yesterday in on belgian tv and um i think it's it's good to see to to get the opinion of somebody who was who was there until very recently on arguably the most professional team, Jumbo Visma, uh, was Giro winner, was second in the tour. So he was up there, you know, he was the top rider. And and he said, you know, we've talked about a few episodes ago about what was the biggest change in the last 25 years technologically. But uh, for him, the biggest change uh, and the biggest challenge is um, how nutrition has changed in the last decade uh, and especially in the last five years 
and how strict those regimes are and how careful you have to be. Um, and that for him, it was really a huge challenge that, you know, he could not deal with it. You know, you wake up in the morning, you have, if, if you want to do everything right, these guys weigh everything they eat. Mm. Everything they eat, everything that goes into their body, it's it's studied. The nutritionists on the teams, there was there was a nutritionist on that show also, uh, the the nutritionist of uh, of Lotto Destiny, and and she said that you know she said she she explained that there was one rider uh, on the team, you know that she knew how many calories he had burned, whether he she had how much. Uh, carbohydrates, how much fat, how much fats, how much proteins. And she had the ideal menu for him in the evening or for the dinner to really replace that. And, and, you know, they are sure that their guys recover, you know, it's, it's everything they do is with, is with, it was a goal. And, uh, and Tom Dumoulin said, you know, the, the way this is done, first of all, it's, it's incredible how an athlete is fine tuned and nothing anymore is left up to hazard, right? It's mm-hmm. it's all controlled. But for him, it was really hard. It was really hard. And he also had a little dig at Walt well, Van Aert, uh, ex-teammate of him, by the way, you know, on Jumbo Visma. And he said that, you know, he, he, he really doesn't understand how Walt Van Aert is racing, you know, going into all these breakaways, really, you know, not being you know, very careful with his, with his efforts, spending energy. Uh, He said he doesn't understand how that fits into the strategy of Jumbo Visma. And at the same time, he was in admiration for, for him. He said, man, if you can do that and you don't pay the price, and it seems like he's not paying the price. um, He says, it's just unbelievable. What an incredible athlete, well, one artist. Hmm. You know, when you talk about the nutrition, I doubt that these guys are pulling over on a training ride for a Snickers and a Mexican Coke like we are. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there, there are times that you can do that. You know, there yeah. are times that you can do that, um, but they have it calculated and, and it's in there. You know, they know, but I think I think especially in, in Grand Tours, uh, especially it's super, super important that. um now they can measure these things and they know for a fact that, you know, with nutrition that starts straight after the finish, nutrition and hydration uh, in a specific way. And then the dinner at, at, in the evening there, they make sure that they're ready for the day after. Yeah, I have whereas, noticed whereas that. Before, before it was just, okay, you know what? Okay, guys, we know that you guys burn a lot of carbs. So carbs, 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 pasta, potatoes, rice. Now it's just the right amount because, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you can stuff yourself full of carbs. Your body can only absorb so much. Mm-hmm. And then if you have so, if you have too much, then where does it go? You know, you're bloated or you're, you know, it's, it's like, it could have the, the opposite effect. Oh, now that's interesting. The right amounts. Yeah. Cause we, we've been weighing the protein portion of a, a meal for years, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's nothing new, but I never thought about it with the pasta. <laughs> yeah. it, and when you are doing a grand tour, you would think you would just eat till you're ready to fall out of your chair. Yeah. Well, no, no it's not the case. It's not the case. <laughs> not, the case. not the case. One more okay. thing, uh, JB, I want to, it's a funny, funny thing. So we've been talking about the radio communication, right? Uh, and the fact that <clears throat> now in this tour de France, um, ASO or French TV, uh, which is the, you know, the, the company that sends out the worldwide signal, they have access to certain parts of the communication between the cars and the riders and back. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know if it's because, I mean, personally, I have not been very impressed with the content of that audio. It was basically just, just normal stuff, you know, like, okay, guys, you know, two kilometers, we have a climb. It's three kilometers long. That's not, so nothing really interesting. So uh, apparently there's been complaints, whether it's from the spectators or also from the the, the production. Um, and so uh, there was one episode, one episode that uh, Mikkel Bjerg from UAE came on the radio. So talking to the car and he said, okay, guys, we now go to plan C. Everyone 
jumps. What? Wait. Everyone jumps the tiger. <laughs> and when the crocodiles have to swim, you all jump. <laughs> so that was, and then he had an interview about it afterwards. So uh, he said he left it <laughs> in doubt whether it was meant as a joke <laughs> or if they, they had code words or certain strategies. Because yeah, it sounds like an old, like you're spoofing an old gangster film where they have the, yeah. the code on the phone for, for, yeah. for murder or something. Yeah, well, I do. I, you know, I know that it's quite easy to listen in to these radio conversations. You know, we've had already some talks about it on the podcasts. Uh, so um, anyway, I don't know if that's it was real or fake, but it was it was funny. That is funny. Now we do. Now we do plan C. Everyone jumps. Everyone jumps on the tiger. And when the crocodiles have to swim, we all jump. <laughs> but just to re reiterate what's going on, I think we all feel the same way. We've been saying this for years on this podcast and on the move that, you know, share some of that radio stuff. It works in other sports, it, you know, comparing it to F1. They're finally doing it and we're all kind of disappointed. Like it's, they're not, there's no real, they're delaying what they release, correct? Mm -hmm. But there's nothing where you just go, oh, that's what they were doing tactically. Like, yeah. But Even you know what, JB, on the other hand, you have to say also, I mean, in, in, to the credit of the teams, you know, what does ASO expect to get that's worth listening to if they pay these guys 5,000 euros right. for their radio communication? Come on. I mean, I wouldn't say shit for 5,000 euros. You know I mean? It's like you're giving away something. I mean, if everybody is the same, fine. I mean, and still, but... You know, we can't expect too much. Uh, I think it's, I think there's this, still this battle going on of, you know, who owns this, right? I, in my opinion, the teams own this content. It's, it's, it happens in their cars between their directors and their riders on their radios and on their bikes, right? Mm. Tour de France has another opinion. They say, no, it happens on the roads of our event. So there's the battle, and and I was surprised to see that that the the teams have agreed to it. I mean, I've asked around a little bit, and it's it's a dodgy deal. It's 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 somebody representing the teams who has negotiated on their behalf without getting the approval of all of them. Most mm -hmm. of the teams have not been very happy with this. You make a very good point because the. The the clips that I see from the team car when they're on the radio, that's some of the best stuff behind the scenes yeah. in a tour. Yeah. And that's content they own and can, you know, monetize with sponsors. So, yeah, ASO gets it for next to nothing. And then they're I, bar I, barely releasing it anyway. I would love I would love to represent the teams and go to war with ASO and the UCI. <laughs> I would love to I don't know if I don't know if my band would allow that, but hey, <laughs> somebody has can look into it. I'm ready. I would be so passionate about this. Johan at we do dot team. <laughs> if you want to get, get this going. Okay. Now uh I don't know if, if you want to do what what like Lance looking forward really wanted to look at the next four stages as a whole. We can do it that way or we can just look at tomorrow. It's up to you. Yeah. Well. And what do you expect from, from GC? Um, it's going to be, I, you know, when I look at it, I'm like, it would be shocking to me if neither of these guys had a bad day. Um, Vingigo or Pogacar had a yeah. bad day in the upcoming days. Like it just seems inevitable. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I mean, if you look at tomorrow, let's, let's first talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow is a stage like yesterday's stage. Uh, it's 169 kilometers. It's very hard. Uh, there's three cat three climbs and two cat two climbs. Uh, this is breakaway day tomorrow. Uh, is, I, I don't think there's anything going to happen for GC. So it's going to be a hard day for, I mean, a semi hard day for, for Jumbo Visma because they have to control, uh, unless they send Sapkus in the break, probably Walt Van Aert. For, this is a rate. This is a good one for Walt Van Aert. So. Uh, who knows, you know, I want to see him get a win. He's been, he it, it hasn't been going his way and he's right there he, all the time. He has to get a win. I mean, it's like, yeah. he's too good. He is too good to not get this win, you know? Uh, but it's not gonna, it's not a GC day tomorrow. 
uh, the days, the, the stages later, that's a different story. You know, you have uh, stage 13 to Grand Colombier. Uh, that's like a one, uh, it's a short stage, 137 kilometers. But uh, the last climb, Grand Colombier, it's horse category. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not very high, but it's super hard. That's like, they, they call that, a, you know, like, um, in Spain, they call it mono puerto. It's like one climb. Uh, so definitely GC day for sure. For sure. That's the battle between the GC guys. Uh, then you have the Saturday, which is to, uh, Morzin, um, not an uphill finish, but an incredibly hard stage. Uh, especially with that last climb called the Juplan. Call the Juplan is, you know, I, I remember the first year I was in France and doing those like Dauphiné and Tour de France. No, we didn't have those devices yet that we could measure, you know, the, uh, it, that we just had the speedometer, you know, with the distance and the, and the, and the speed and the average speed. But, uh, I had a guy with me and the team was the leader of the team, Claude de Criquillon, who was world champion in the past, sadly passed away too young, uh, a few years ago. And he always told me, he said, Juplan, that's just a monster. He said, it's 10 kilometers, 10%. Which, you know, it looks like, you know, right here he said, they say 11 and 11.6 kilometers, eight and a half percent. And I think that includes the top, which flattens out a little bit. Um, but I know these climbs before here, you know, I mean, uh, Col, Col de la Cru, Col de Forclas, uh, no, sorry. Yeah. Col de la Ramas, sorry. Col de la Ramas, which is, which is very, very hard. Uh, Juplan and then the downhill into, into Morzin. That's a real, real, real big up stage. So that's going to be very decisive for the GC. And then, um, the Sunday stage, which is also super, super hard. Uh, three category one climbs and, uh, a third category climb and a second category climb finishing in, uh, Saint Gervais Mont Blanc. Um, yeah, those, those three stages are going to be, I think, I think the tour, the tour will be decided in these three stages. And if not, then it's going to be the time trial, mm. uh, two days later. But I think the three stages in the Alps are going to be decisive. Um, they're both in really good shape. You know, I saw a, a quote here from Marijn Zeman, who is the, like the, the head guy in Jumbo Visma. You know, he's, he's, he's very, very methodical and he has done his math and his calculations. And he said that Pogacar and Vingegaard, obviously he knows the, he knows the performances of Jonas Vingegaard. And he said, both of them did the best perform their best performance ever on the Puy de Dome. Mm -hmm. And they were only eight seconds apart. So they are very, very equal because this is their best ever. Yeah. <clears throat> So it's, you know, it's great. It's great. You know, we don't, we're, we, you know, it's going to depend on who has a bad day, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, now, is the, is the weather going to be an influence? Is it going to be hot? Is it going to rain? Uh, we don't know, but it's, yeah. I mean, Sepp Kuss actually said that, you know, until now, I mean, he's just, of course a super climber, but he said, until now, we haven't had a real mountain stage yet. I don't know which races he has been doing in the Pyrenees, <laughs> but for him, it's he, we haven't had a real mountain stage yet. So wow, that that's... means that the hardest, the hardest is to come. Oof. Okay, uh, you know, a um, couple shows ago, you you kind of did this visual of you felt like Jonas was at his peak. Can he hold it? But you felt like Pogacar was on his way up as this tour progresses. Do you feel still feel that way? Well, I mean, if if I if I believe Berlin Zeman, that's his peak. You know, I mean, obviously these guys also know. I mean, these guys are sports scientists. They they measure everything from from their riders and from their opponents. So, you know, he he can't get much better, right? The thing is that I think that Pogacar, since he's coming, he can for sure maintain it. But well, Jonas Vingegaard is going to be the, the, the question. Can he maintain it after having being up there for a longer period of time? Right. From doing um, the, the Dauphiné. Dauphiné. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, they would they would argue that he was not at his best at the Dauphiné, and that he still improved after the Dauphiné. That could also be uh, true. Um, I think it's all. I mean, it's uh, being at your peak is not just physically; it's also mentally. Yeah. Uh, because it's it has it's not just what 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 you're physically be able to. It's how much you can suffer, how much you can get in the zone. It's a combination of a lot of different factors, right? And as I said a few days ago, you know, that Pogacar had the upper hand in the mental war. Um, and and I, I still think that's the case, although you can see clearly that Jonas Vingegaard in his interviews, he's talking himself up. You know, he says he feels great. He's never felt better. You know, he's waiting. He can't wait for the Alps. So it, it, there is a mental war going on there. Uh, and and I think they're very equal. You know, we've seen they're very equal. So I if, mean, uh, if, what if, what if, what if, what if the Tour de France gets decided by the bonifications? Oof. The possibility. Yeah, that's something Spencer said on our preview. Uh huh. <laughs> right? Didn't he say that this might come he down did, to both? He did say that. He did say that. Uh, quick side question: If uh, Pogacar wasn't having to do podiums as the youngest rider in the white jersey every day, would he be giving interviews? He would be giving interviews, but he would, you know, go just go there straight away, uh, give a few interviews at the bus, okay, and then just go right. Uh, I'm, I'm just my, where I'm going with this. His his day yeah. is more complicated because of this ri- young rider's jersey. He's stuck with it until next next year. He doesn't have to do that anymore. Yeah, he's stuck with it. You know, that's a, that's taxing on his time and energy. Yeah, yeah. So you know, they're, even there, they're equal. You know, because yeah. <laughs> so Vingegaard yeah. is in yellow. He's in white. They have they have to spend the same amount of time after the stage, not being able to go to the hotel. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, I think they're in equal, it's a level playing field. All right, let's tackle a few questions and I'll let you get on to outcomes and Lama Vita. I know you're busy. Uh, see this person writes, this is, uh, Matt. We, we don't have uh, we don't have the trivia question, the Ventum trivia. Oh, I do have Ventum trivia. Okay. <laughs> Thank let's you. Start with that. You're more organized than I am today. <laughs> yes. Let's do that. Uh, yesterday's Ventum trivia question was, and get ready to jot down this email address so you can enter, enter today with the correct answer and potentially win a brand new NS1 from Ventum, their road bike. Yesterday's question was who was Lance Armstrong's youth swim coach? I don't know how you found that online, but uh, the answer was Chris McCurdy. Chris McCurdy. And uh, today's question is, who was the tallest person ever to race in the tour? Tallest person ever. The tallest person ever. Wow. I, I will tell you this. They were six six, six foot six. Although you, you don't know what that means, do you? <laughs> What's six six? Uh, <laughs> I have no. Let me see. <laughs> let me see. Six. Six. <laughs> six. I had to do feet to inches, right? Oh, one hundred nine. Well, almost two meters. Um. <laughs> how recent is it? Uh, you know what? I don't. I don't have a year next to it. I don't okay. have a I have a name, but I don't have a year next to it. So I, I don't. I think I think I know. Yeah, I and you guys, you guys can all picture how tall George looked on a bike at six. Oh, this guy, this guy's taller for sure. Yeah, the guy so, I know is taller. Okay, so if you uh, do whatever you need to do, if, you know, do the research, find the right answer, and email it to trivia at ventumracing dot com. Each day from the correct answers, they're drawing one person on the last day, stage 21, we will draw from those names and someone will get a complete NS1. All right. Good luck. All right. Now to these questions real quick. Here we go. Uh, Matt writes, I'd be interested to hear more insight into rider contracts with Wout potentially leaving the tour at any point. Does he still get the same pay he would if he finished? Do racers have a certain number of premier races? Uh, do they have win bonuses worked in? What if they get injured for a significant portion of the season? How does that salary work for the for the year? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean the the riders get 
a salary uh, that that's their contract. So independently whether they um, race or injured or that, they have that guaranteed. Um, so I guess for the big, I would guess for the big big contracts, teams probably ensure that in case mm. something happens. Um, that would be an expensive policy because it's very high risk. I know, I know, but you know what? I mean, listen, at least, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what the cost would be, but there's probably a way to kind of half insure it or I, I don't know, but, um, but then most, some riders depends on how good they are. They get bonuses for certain results. So obviously the better rider you are, the higher your salary is the least bonuses you will get. I mean, hmm. Walt Van Aert will not get a bonus if he wins a stage in the tour. He's paid for that. He's pay, his salary is already expecting that. Walt Van Aert will probably, would probably get a bonus if he's world champion. Okay. Well, That's that actually <laughs> makes sense with, with Walt Van Aert. If he was getting big bonuses for winning too, that would add more Jumbo Visma confusion, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's the only race that I can imagine that Walt Van Aert should get a bonus for because obviously, I mean, I don't know how much he's paid, but he's obviously paid a good, a good amount of money uh, based on what he has done. And, um, you know, if you're world champion, of course, it's a, it's a whole different game. Um, and then, you know, you have other, other riders who are not paid as much, who have bigger bonuses because for a team, the likelihood that that's going to happen is a lot less. Yeah. But I do know, for example, uh, last year or two, I think last year, um, Remco Evenepoel had a lot of bonuses because he signed his contract, I think, two or three years before. And he got an incredible amount of money in, in bonuses, like probably more than his contract. Oh, wow. Wow. What about all Johan and JB? Do they get bonuses? No, we, oh, we have to look into that. We have to look into that, JB. We, uh, We're here for the love of the game. Yeah. So, so <laughs> members, members, listeners, <laughs> click on it. Click on it. We need to. We need more. We need more downloads. <laughs> uh, let's see. We actually for for a stage where not much has happened. We we've covered a lot today. So I'll do one more question. Uh, greetings from Reno, Nevada. I'm a refugee from Bilbao, Spain. Still glowing about Pale Bilbao stage victory. If you were starting as a writer today, and they're talking to you specifically, Johan, which team would you want to be a part of? That's from Miguel. Well, that's a difficult question, man. I mean, if you're young, it, first of all, it depends on what kind of writer you are, right? And, and of course, the logical thinking would be, well, you know, I want to be on UAE or Jumbo Visma or Ineos. Those are like the the big teams. Uh, that's not necessarily always the best as a young rider because there is a likely uh, probable chance that you're going to get lost. You know, as, as a young rider, you're going to be on the B program on the C program. And, and there's not, there's obviously there's less attention, less resources, less staff, not saying it's bad, but it's probably better if you're a very talented young rider that you go to one of those sub top teams. Um, what would I say? Uh, for example, Little Trek or uh, Intermarché or uh, I don't know. I mean, Bahrain or you know where you where you you have more possibilities to ride races that are good for you because if you get in a big team first of all you don't you know you're not going to do the big races and that's not necessary you don't need to but then you have the second tier races where there's a lot of competition because all these good riders want to do these races to get to prepare for the big races so there's not a lot of a lot not a lot of spots available um i would rather uh think it's it's a different question you would have to ask and and say you know what uh jumbo visma for example um i i see that they have an incredible 
pyramid of, of teams. You know, they have their pro team, they have their women's team, and they have development teams going from the juniors to the 123. And, and they are producing really top of the world 123 riders. You know, there's there's a few riders that will go to the to the elite next year who are incredibly good. Um, but also there, it's not for everybody. You know, it's 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 already a heavy competition. You have to be amongst the best of the world to get in those development teams, and then to make it, uh, it's 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 not easy. So sometimes it's even better to go on a lower level team and just try to show what you're worth. You know, I mean. Cont- Pro continental teams are fine, you know. I mean, there there's plenty of those, um, and I think that if you have it in you, you can you can show it and you can make it. So it's not necessarily the best team. Um, I mean, if I can choose one team, um, I don't know. I mean, personally, I probably say Ineos because. You know, they're good, they have the resources, and they don't, for the moment, have the top rider. So I think there's room there for talents to show themselves more than in Jumbo Visma and UAE. Now, I, I think I would add to, to this, that, and I'd love your thoughts. Like, if I'm a young rider, I would look at who the experienced riders on, are on that team that I can learn from as well. Mm-hmm. So you, like for Ineo, something like... I would try to get as much ride time with Garen Thomas as I could. Yeah. Right. And that's a whole other mentor available to you. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. And, uh, and a guy like Garen Thomas, obviously I think he also, uh, would make the time for that. You know, we all know, even if he was very close to winning the Giro, you know, lost it in the second last stage, but I can see him as being somebody who would take time out of his schedule to to do that whereas you know you're with with Jumbo and I mean all the good guys are super focused on their own results and uh yeah yeah I, 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 the Jumbo the, the the Ineos option would be a, a good one if you would have said you know a few years ago I probably said no because Ineos was on the top and they had you yeah. know it was but but nowadays you know you also know that if you're in Ineos Today, you do you, as a young rider. I've seen in the past that young riders, when they were at certain races, they use them just to pull. You know, nowadays that's not the case. You don't have to pull all the time because they ne- don't necessarily have all the time a rider that can win. So, I think for the moment, the nails would be good. Okay. All right, uh, Miguel. Thanks for your question. And if you have a question for a future show for Johan, please send it in. JB squared. It's JB two at we do.team and Johan, we'll talk tomorrow. Okay, JB, thanks. Speak tomorrow.